Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel. Let me ask you to picture something. An industrial landscape birthed from the ashes of an apocalypse. The people here breathe smoke, their oceans are filled with plastic. A child sits alone in a room, gasping for air. He has your eyes. They're filled with fear. And then, a guy in a baseball uniform comes by and- Bases, bases all around the industry is crumbling down. Whether the weather is fair or not, the baseball day must be stopped. Bases, bases all around the industry is crumbling down. Whether the weather is fair or not, the baseball day must be stopped. Welcome back everyone. Today we're continuing our series of explorations and retrospectives over some RPG Maker horror games, although this game isn't really explicitly horror. Last time we did the 2004 Yume Niki, which was a sort of strange, surreal exploration game without a lot of plot, but this game, Off, the 2008 French-Belgian surrealist RPG, is a lot more straightforward in that it has a plot and puzzles and even a classic RPG combat system. Oh, while I'm here, I released a new album uh, that is out right now on pretty much all streaming services called Morbid Curiosity. It's full of a bunch of original spooky songs. Check that out. But without further ado, let's talk about Off. Off was created by game dev duo Unproductive Fun Time, comprised of Mortis Ghost and alias Conrad Coldwood. Mortis Ghost handling the art and most of the game design, and then alias Conrad Coldwood producing the music. Both artists have a pretty impressive list of other solo projects, although most of them came out after Off. Um, but to get an idea of who these people behind this game are, I think it's a good idea to look at some of their solo work. Also, just I think it deserves a shout out because they have a lot of really good stuff outside of Off being their most popular. Mortis Ghost's forte isn't usually games. Going to his Tumblr will reveal his focus has been on art and comics, most notably his Dr. Cataclysm comic. Ghost has a very specific style, and you can see it follow through in all of his art, from off, before, and onwards. Dr. Cataclysm has this wonderful, chaotic, humorous energy that I can't recommend enough. I haven't got around to finishing it yet, but it's bursting with style and personality and is a genuine joy to read. As of 2020, Mortis Ghost is working on a new game, Vold Vago, which is presumably still in development. As well, he's written or illustrated smaller projects, like writing Star Delivery, which was illustrated by Marie Spinal, contributed art to the Atlas of Fantastic Worlds, a fictional world-building book, and other comic series like The Skydivers. So, as you might guess, Mortis Ghost's art style is going to play a big role in this game. Alias Conrad Coldwood is also an artist, both visually but also musically, and Coldwood's music was his main contribution to the game. Now, despite Mortis Ghost being more of the mastermind behind this project, Project, Coldwood's soundtrack is one of the most iconic and memorable parts of the entire game. Outside of Off, however, he's created multiple other music projects, such as the album Crying Girls. His style of atmospheric, lo-fi, industrial electronic music really shines through on that album specifically, and also shows off his versatility, switching from beautiful piano pieces to compressed industrial bangers. Coldwood's music has this uncanny ability to switch seamlessly from calming melancholy to genuinely anxiety-inducing. His other Another big project is Wastes, an album that is continuously being added to, started in 2014, and is now up to 56 plus tracks. Together, these two friends created Unproductive Fun Time, the name that they would publish their first game off under. Since then, the team has created a few smaller projects, mostly for game jams. There is a picture for Ludum Dare 23, and Free Puzzle and Duplo, featuring art from the duo. As well, multiple maps for the likes of Duke Nukem and Kingpin, including a horror map for Kingpin, texture mods, for System Shock 2, and a tool that allows you to convert maps from 2.5D games like Doom, Duke Nukem, and the like between each other, and onto the Quake map format. Their website also hosts links to their solo projects like Dr. Cataclysm and Coldwood's Music. It seems like the website is being run by Coldwood. The last update was February 2021, so fairly recent in the scheme of things. But let's take a step back and take a look at the development of Off, which was their breakout project. There isn't a ton of information out there from what I could find about the actual development process of Off, but we do know a bit about where the team was coming from when designing the game. First off, we know something that didn't inspire them, which I only mention because it's surprising to see a game in this style that wasn't inspired by the Mother series. 
According to Mortis Ghost, he didn't even know about the series at the time. Which is odd for a meta RPG maker game about a main character fighting enemies with a bat to not be inspired by Earthbound, or at least one of the other Mother games. Instead, he took inspiration from a few other places. First, he took inspiration from Silent Hill in building his world and environments, which you can definitely feel when exploring the game. Along with that, Myst was a game of influence, which is always good to hear. I have so many nostalgic memories of playing through Myst or watching my siblings play it around the family computer. Myst has such a unique atmosphere that it's cool seeing it get a little love. I realized the moment I fell into the vision. One final place of inspiration falls on the 2000 2005 action-adventure game Killer7, a highly stylized first-person shooter with unconventional mechanics in an odd world, brimming with political discourse. Taking all these influences and crafting them into the game, Unproductive Fun Time would release off in 2008, but it wouldn't reach wider success until the game was eventually translated from French to English by some fans in 2011. This opened up the game to a whole new market of people, which led to a new wave of players. So let's talk about the game they played. Now, Off is really built around its linear story, but I want to wait to open that can of worms. So for now, let's just talk about the gameplay. Basically, you play as this guy, the batter, and are here on a mission to purify the world, starting with ridding it of an infestation of specters. To start though, let's look purely at the gameplay elements of this game. The game has two modes of interacting with the world exploring, solving puzzles, and looting in the overworld, and fighting enemies in an RPG-style battle system. Let's start with the battle system. Most people will agree with me here, even the most hardcore fans of Off. The combat leaves a lot to be desired. It's serviceable, but it takes up maybe too much of the gameplay time and it gets pretty boring fast. It works like a lot of RPGs, sometimes through random encounters, sometimes from characters you can see in the overworld, and sometimes in boss fights. Now, forgive me here as I'm not an RPG person, so I might not be getting all the terminology right, but instead of working in a typical turn-based fashion, each character has a timer, including the enemies. So they can attack while you attack, and you can attack or defend on the fly. You can't see the enemy's timers, but you can keep track of yours and your party members for when it's their turn to move. Knowing my audience, the closest analog to compare this to would be FNAF World's combat system. I really can't ever escape it. Most times you'll enter into combat from random encounters that occur just from wandering around the map. Other times it'll be a little bit easier to track, like in these areas in the smoke mines by the chests. Like a lot of RPGs, fighting is a team effort. As you play through the game, you'll collect new party members known as add-ons. They're circles. It makes sense in the game. Kinda. Anyway, all of these characters you can equip with different items and level up separately. Now, I've simplified it a bit, but there are some more subtleties to the mechanics. Different characters have different competences, which are special moves and abilities. For instance, the batter's wide angle, which lets him analyze enemies. Alongside that, there are different elements that the characters can either have weaknesses or resistances to, which some attacks and abilities can be associated with. The thing is... None of these things really matter that much. The most useful thing you can do in combat of the game is hit the auto choice, which will mean the computer does your attacks for you. The combat is incredibly easy and doesn't really take any strategizing to win an encounter. Most battles will come down to spamming spacebar. There's an argument to be made that the ease of the combat encounters is intentional, but it doesn't really change the fact that it isn't really fun. You can loot and buy new items and stuff, but I never really found a need to do that. It's an overstated criticism, sure, but still valid. The combat, despite some of the attempts in depth, really is the weakest point of the game, and just takes up too much time. However, for the most part, that's where my criticisms end for the game. So let's talk about the better parts of the gameplay. Aside from the combat, the focus of your gameplay is going to be on completing puzzles, and all the puzzles have an interesting quality to them. They're not like physics puzzles, but more brain teasers, number puzzles, or mazes. Like this area, where you have to refer to an imperfect map to find where it's safe to walk without being attacked by enemies. Or the game's most favorite puzzle, numbers somewhere in the world that correspond to blocks that act as a password. Which ended up being a bit too much trouble, so I just started brute forcing the password. Never underestimate a stupid person. Oh, one other type of puzzle that's probably really important to mention, switch-based puzzles. They show up a few times in the latter half of the game and are pretty simple. Different combinations of the switch 
switches being on or off open or close different areas. You can only turn the switches on or off. Despite just being the game's name, the relevance of that will become clear later. To wrap up this purely gameplay segment of the video, let's talk about the environment, the zones, and looting items. So, like I said, the goal of the game is to purify the world. In this case, the world is split up into three zones, which you must purify in order to unlock the next. You access them through your hub world, the nothing. There's also the room, but it'll be easier to explain that area in the story section. But it's basically the last section of the game. Inside of these zones, you'll be solving puzzles, fighting off specters, and interacting with the many NPCs that inhabit the world. And finally, beating a boss that will purify a zone. After a zone has been purified, you can go back to find higher levels of loot, and also fight higher level enemies. I don't want to exactly show what that looks like though, because that would be more spoilery territory. There's also Zone Zero, but that's more so the tutorial. Throughout these areas, besides the puzzles and combat, you can find chests with items. These can vary from healing and revival items to consumable attack items that do a lot of damage. While it can be fun trying to get to all of these chests, even the ones that are hidden or harder to get to, again, I never really needed to use the items, especially since... Oh, right, saving. So, you can save in slots like most RPG games from these cubes. They also will restore your health and revive your party members. There's almost always one close by, so you never really need to use any of the healing items, which is another reason you'll never really need to use items. The saving cubes at the start of the level also let you teleport back to the nothing. All right. So, without spoiling too much of the story, that's basically a rundown of the gameplay. I went back and forth as to whether I should get right into the story from this point or talk about the visuals and audio first, but I want to get straight into the analysis from the story, so let's talk a bit about the presentation of the game first. Now, there's a lot I could say about the art in this game, but let's just start simple with the sprite and art in the overworld. For the most part, these are incredibly simple. The characters are all done in black and white with pretty bare bones detail and strong dark lines. Far from the detailed and shaded character sprites you'll see in a lot of RPG Maker games, the art in this part of the game feels considerably more stripped down and cartoonish. Contrasting the black and white color scheme of the characters, the environments have similarly bold lines and simplified designs, but are all done in these incredibly vibrant monochromatic tones varying in each area. When it comes to the overworld segments of the game, the most accurate term I can give the art is contrast. Whether it's the strong lines, the contrast of black and white, or the contrast of the saturated colors of the environment and the complete desaturation of the characters. And look, say all you want about these sprites being lower effort than some of the more detailed art of other RPG Maker games, it definitely gives the game a distinct personality, and personally I like it. Now, the sprite work may be unique, but that alone doesn't justify this game's art taking such a big spot in the list of iconic things about it. No, the reason the game's art has such a focus is because of the more detailed character art, most often seen in the battles and character icons. Mortis Ghost's unique style really shines through in each and every one of these characters, from the batter himself to the many eclectic characters you run into, to the widely varying and fun bosses, to the many different enemy designs. Not only are the design concepts of these characters incredibly diverse and strange, from ghosts to giant floating whales, the actual style is pretty standout, especially in the context of RPG Maker games. Much like the overworld sprites, the characters are all done in black and white, but also have this really sketchy, surreal flair to them. It's this wonderful mix of cartoonishly goofy and sometimes genuinely unsettling, and other times somewhere in between. Getting to see new enemy designs genuinely makes it almost worth it doing the combat. Almost. And the rare occasions the drawn art come out into the overworld feels genuinely magical. Now, we'll get more into the story reasons for this later, but the visuals are one of the areas of this game that really showcase the Silent Hill inspiration. Not necessarily in style, but in atmosphere. Everything feels stark and barren, and moody, and areas of the minds that use darkness end up creating genuine horror moments. Oh, and one last little note on the art. There's this really cool use of old diagrams and industrial art that really adds this odd mix of realism and also surrealism at the same time, when paired with what the rest of the world looks like. If you're looking for more of the art after the game, Mortis Ghost has some other art of the characters out there, including a short little comic, and of course, there's always Mortis Ghost's other projects too. When it comes to the sound in the game, there's not a lot to talk about outside of the music. There's no real dialogue and the sound effects are pretty stripped down. I will say though, the sound effects in the combat are really satisfying and nice. The game also pulls some spooky tricks at times, like replacing the main battle theme at unexpected times or hiding creepy whispers in the background ambience of certain sections. But really, we're here to talk about the soundtrack. The music really is one of the most iconic parts of the game, so I feel like we should pay it some special attention. Let me get into a more music review -y mood. Ah, 
Hey everyone, Sanctony Hawk Tano here, the internet's busiest horror retrospective nerd, and it's time for a review of this new Alias Conrad Coldwood record, Off. This is the 2008 full-length LP that served as the soundtrack for Unproductive Fun Times game of the same name. And this project has quite the track list covering a lot of ground. Starting with Global, which is essentially the main sound effect that most of the NPCs use in this game when you talk to them. Before moving into more atmospheric cuts like Silencio, which plays in the nothingness, aka the main world map of the game. A cacophony of eerie whispers that build over the track's 56 second runtime that give this overbearing sense of dread. While it's hard to make out exactly what's being said, you can make out snippets of things like, I'm glad you killed me, and it's good you killed them. And this record really does embrace the creep factor and tension, with a lot of these cuts being very industrial and noise music inspired, but not afraid to get a bit more relaxed and melodic in tracks like A Stab at Happiness and 14 Residents. Which brings a melancholy calmness to the album, with these slow and mournful pianos playing over this uneasy whispered synths. It would almost be tranquil if it wasn't for the occasional stuttered piano note or ominous soundscape that the piano plays under. Or on tracks like Stay in Your Coma, which packs a lot of punch for being as short as it is, featuring two harmonizing vocals repeating the title over another reverberating industrial beat. It's giving lullaby that is barely keeping a monster asleep. Despite the LP being mostly grim and brooding, that doesn't stop it from occasionally going into more boppy territory with tracks like Pepper Steak, which acts as the main battle theme. For the role that it plays, it feels a little bit unconventional. An electro swing sample being played over this booming industrial beat with the brass instrumentation sounding sort of muddy and all over the place, like it's being played out of an old tape deck in an empty warehouse as machinery comes alive around it. Despite its unorthodox nature, it's incredibly catchy and you can still catch me singing the It fits perfectly with the quirky sort of chaos the game delivers as a whole. Or on tracks like Flesh Maze Tango, which has a similarly catchy piano sample that is then played over more industrial beats and then this melodic sort of cowbell sound. The versatility on display on this album is not lost on me as it moves from beautiful to disturbing pretty seamlessly. The difference between cuts like Rainy Day and Meat, which may require a strong stomach to get all the way through. It starts with this calming sort of wispy soundscape that has a surprisingly nice groove along with these samples of rainfall. Where it gets really interesting is the last minute or so of the song where these sort of mournful synths continue to play as the sound of sizzling meat sort of overbearingly fades in and continues for the remainder of the song. The paralleling here of the peaceful, calm sounds of rainfall and the sonically similar but very emotionally different sound of sizzling meat uh, really does create this disturbing air to the whole song and it works perfectly in this wonderfully backwards world of off. And so then you contrast that with a track like Empty Warehouse, which is genuinely relaxing and beautiful with these almost Ghibli-esque synths and strings playing alongside this compressed sound of sloshing water before moving into more mysterious vibes with bells and this sort of quirky little rhythm section complete with more compressed uh, audio clips, this time sounding kind of like pieces of wood knocking together. It all comes together to create a sound that wouldn't be out of place in a point-and-click adventure game. This LP also serves the story of the game really well, with tracks like Soft Breeze, which has this breeze-like, relaxed, calming synth, but over it is this booming bass line and incredibly powerful industrial beat, simultaneously giving the feeling of cool and relaxed, but also driven and powerful, which we'll come to learn is actually a really good encapsulation of the batter character. Or on Desperately Safe, which uses slow and compressed synths and piano chords to tug at your heartstrings, which works perfectly for the very empty Zone 2, the area of the game where it's first played. Overall, this LP is a really great companion to the game that it comes from, and does a lot of the heavy lifting in creating the atmosphere of the game. I'm feeling a light to decent 8 on this one. Tran. New costume, all right. We've tipped out around the story for long enough now, so let's break it down. I have this set up into five sections. 
zones 0 to 3, and then the room. Let's start with the opening of the game. The game starts by asking for your name. Like many of these meta RPG games, it isn't asking for your character's name. It's asking for your name. I'm sure that won't mean anything later. You're then assigned to control the batter, a baseball uniform wearing dude on a mission to purify the world. It's made very clear that you are a separate entity from the batter, but you are in control of him. In fact, he even says it himself, telling you how to control his body. From here, you're in zone zero, and you're sent to find the judge, someone who will tell you more. Moving forward, you run into this Cheshire Smile cat who introduces himself as the judge. He says that no other living being should exist in Zone Zero, so you must be a figment of his imagination. Another little factoid that I'm sure has nothing to do with anything. Still, he introduces himself and specifically calls out us, the player, calling us the puppeteer. The judge speaks in long-winded, sort of meandering sentences, in contrast to the batter who basically talks like the Chad memes. Okay. As the judge and batter continue to converse, the judge begins to suspect that we aren't an imaginary being, and perhaps entirely real, which is odd to him because he assumed that Zone Zero was empty of all other beings. Either way, he leads you through a brief tutorial, solving some block puzzles and a brief combat tutorial in which the judge tells us that the other zones are not going to be so hospitable. The judge chows down on some food, and in this downtime, it allows you to loot some chests before moving to the next zone via the saving blocks, which takes you to the nothingness. So this is our world map, this unsettling, abstract void. Only having just unlocked zone one, we move there. We enter into the rainy zone one, where we meet some other humanoids, the Elsin, named this by the community because that is the location we first find them. They are the workers, citizens, and population of these zones. Using the tram to get around, you find your way to the opening of a mine, where an Elsin greets you and asks you what you're here for, to which the batter says he's here to exterminate impure spirits. Strangely, the Elson seems to think this is business as usual. It means our requests have been acknowledged, and the Elson explains our mission. As old diagrams and illustrations fade on screen, he explains where you are. You're at the smoke mines of Damien, the southern part of Zone 1. Here, we send workers into deep tunnels to unearth metal from the ground, freeing embedded smoke that was trapped in the depths. Thanks to a variety of tools, we are able to put some of it into bottles, which the Queen sends to the other zones. The rest of it flows free, forming the air that our lungs inhale and exhale. Uh, so we can live. As the first of four elements, it's an important element. Because without smoke, people would have nothing to breathe. The problem, the Elson says, is that the mines have been overrun by specters, which is your mission to help remove. It's worth noting, the vibe of the conversation is more so that neither you nor the Elson really know what's going on. The Elson seems to be under the impression that you were sent by upper management, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And the batter doesn't even really seem to understand that there's a specter issue, as he always describes his goal in more vague terms, the impures. Either way, your goals seem to line up, but the Elson says it's against protocol to let visitors into the mines. Instead, he sends you down to an annex tunnel where another worker said he saw something strange, and perhaps that was the source of the specters. Inside of the tunnel, you find the judge. Is this the leader of the specters? No, he reassures you, but does introduce you to what you may be looking for, though it is not a specter. This is known as an add-on. Okay. The judge says he's failed to approach it himself, but perhaps our less physically ordered nature would allow us to. It's worth noting here that though the judge has acknowledged us as real, it seems there's something more metaphysical about us and the batter. The add-on joins our party, and when we check its info, we see that its class is father. Odd. Having failed to find any specters here, we go back to the Elson topside. Given the special circumstances, the Elson begrudgingly lets us down to the mines to fix this specter problem. Inside, we see more Elson, one of which tells us that not all the lights will work down here. Going deeper, we see another save point, but before we can use it, we're surrounded. The specters. Here we enter our first bit of combat, seeing the add-on has joined us. Something the batter notes is practical once we've bossed and bashed the hell out of the ghosts. Anyway, from here you can continue to explore the mines, fighting many varieties of specters off and finding an Elson every once in a while. It's worth noting these Elson seem pretty preoccupied with being good, productive workers. Arriving on the other side of the mine, you pop up in a new area of Zone 1, where another Elson greets you, vaguely confused by your sudden appearance. He asks if you were sent by the Queen or Dedan, who's a character we'll meet soon, to which the batter says, no. Seeing as you seem to be here to deal with the Spectre problem, this Elson lets you know that they have Spectres in their barns as well. You're at the metal farmsteads of Pentel, the eastern part of Zone 1. Our work consists of cutting livestock in two and extracting the metallic boulders that are contained in the cadavers. All the poor quality metal is discarded, forming the ground we walk on. The rest gets purified to make tools and other objects with. 
Some of it is also put into crates and sent to the other zones, so they have tools and soil as well, I suppose. As the first of the four elements, it's an important element. Because without metal, people would have nothing to walk on. They would sink and drown. Wait, I thought that smoke was the first of the four? Either way, taking a quick detour from purifying the mines, we make our way to purifying these barns. Being so small, this is a fairly easy task, but just as you leave the barn, we see something play out outside. We see Dedan, the Queen's inspector of Zone 1 outside, berating the Elsin for letting some stranger roam about, but he's confident that these specters will end up killing the batter because Dedan feels he's the only one powerful enough to fight them off. In spite of his apparent ability to fight the Elsin off, he decides that because of their insolence, he leaves them to the specters. The batter comes out and talks to the Elsin who, surprised you're alive, explains that that was the supervisor, to which the batter responds, you mean specter? Despite the Elsin's pleading, the batter seems to take on Dedan as an enemy who must be destroyed. However, the Elsin is able to convince the batter to finish his work in the smoke mines. On your way back to the mines, you pass by more Elsin, who seem to be extracting metal from the bisected cattle. Delving underground once again, you fight off more and more specters, and to clear your path, you have to flip a switch off the first of a few in this game. Pushing forward, you find someone new, someone who introduces himself as Zachary. Pretty much all of his dialogue breaks the fourth wall. He knows he's in a game, he makes comments on the writing of the game and his role as the merchant. Buy some stuff from him if you want, but again, you don't really need anything. And besides, he'll be back. Along your way, you find an elevator and an Elson who introduces you to the newest area. You're at the plastic administrations of Sashithada, the northern part of Zone 1. Our work consists of filling in forms. Afterwards, we wrap them with string and send them to the courier service. There, they ship the packages, and in return, we receive parcels of plastic. There is a lot of liquid plastic that forms the lakes and oceans. There is also solid plastic, used to make various objects. As the first of the four elements, it's an important element. Because without plastic, the world would have no boundaries. People would walk and walk without ever stopping. The first... never mind. The Elson tells you that the specters come from the postal service. It's just that nobody remembers which floor that is that they're coming from. And the building has... Oh, goddamn. The first thing to do, obviously, is check out the ground floor and the top floor. The ground floor, like most of the other floors, is just filled with office workers meandering. When talking to the Elson in this building, they mostly just give you random form numbers. Going to the top of the floor leads you to the roof, which I feel like has to be a Yumeniki reference with the cat and everything. Talking to the judge here, he gives us a hint about paying attention to the numbers the office workers are saying. So this puzzle is kind of mid because basically you just have to talk to all of these guys until you come upon a room of Elson who all say the same numbers. So, we can use that to find the lost property office to grab some items, and using the other numbers to find the postal service area where a single Elson is. Instead of speaking with you, he attacks, and we see that something is definitely wrong with this guy. Investigating this enemy shows he's a burnt Elson, who has some sort of ailment. After ending this poor and unfortunate soul, you complete another puzzle which involves finding numbers and notes, and then using that as the secret code that lets you enter to Dan's office. There, you find a Dan fighting specters off. Afterwards, he notices you. Big battle incoming? Nope, the Dan simply threatens to kill you if you don't take you and your specters out of here before teleporting away. Well, it's clear we've got to find him. Going back to the tram station, we visit the final area of Zone 1, Alma. After a quick puzzle involving finding answers to questions hidden in posters, with the Elson standing guard turning into a burnt Elson, we're let into the final industrial section, where an Elson explains this element, meat. You're at the meat fountains of Alma, the center of the first zone. Here, meat flows freely, continually filling these immense pools you see before you. Our work consists of pouring this meat into bottles before the fountains overflow. The meat is then immediately delivered to all the other zones from zone one on. As the first of the four elements, it's an important element. Because without meat, people would have nothing to eat. They would die of starvation, one after another. The Elson asks us why we're here, to which the batter says he's looking for to Dan, and to liberate the world of malignance. To which the Elson responds, can you liberate me, before entering into combat. It seems this burnt ailment really is tormenting these Elson, to the point where they would rather be killed by the batter. When you kill this Elson, he simply says, perhaps it will get better now, before disappearing. 
Damn. We run into Zachary again, where he once again directs his speaking to us, the player. The majority of the puzzle solving in this segment is using this duck called a padello, which lets us move through the meat and then completing more block puzzles. We also encounter more burnt Elson who appear to be in incredible distress. The final puzzle of this area is a maze. I don't know what to call these types of mazes, but essentially it's the same room with different doors, and you have to essentially trial and error your way to the correct series of doors. And once you do, we find Dan. And just as we've come to expect from him at this point, he berates us horribly before trying to kill us. After a slightly more difficult, but still fairly easy battle, Dan is defeated in shock. The batter says, this land is now pure as the world fades to white. And then we fade into a red room, with what appears to be a toddler sitting in the middle of the room, fiddling with a handful of meat. That started badly, and now we're back to the nothingness. Alright then. So before we go to zone 2, you might want to check out what the now purified zone 1 looks like, like I did. Are the Elsin cured of their burnt ailment? Are they happier now that Dan's iron fist no longer grasps their zone? How has this purification gone down? Let's check it out. Oh, we're greeted with a barren and stark wasteland. All the color has now been stripped out, every living thing gone. The unnerving whispers of not safe play as you wander through the now empty shell of where you just were. The only things left are incredibly difficult enemies in this area that appear as random encounters. The secretaries, mutilated and warped humanoid shapes. I'm not sure things are much better now that they've been purified. What does purification even mean? Are we helping anyone? Despite strange moments here and there so far, this is the first time in the game where you begin to really question what the effects of what you're doing are. And to be fair, many of the residents of this zone were burnt and seemingly in pain and in torment. Maybe they would have preferred it this way. But then what are the secretaries? Are these more specters that have overrun the zone without anyone here? Is this what the Elsin turned into? It's not really clear, but aside from more loot and experience, there's not much to gain from this place, so we just have to move on. Maybe there will be more answers in zone 2. Zone 2 introduces us first to a library, which has also been overrun by specters. The Elson occupying the library here seem very nervous and downright afraid of everything. They'd like to just stand and stare at the wall. They also tell you that there's an old cat up in the library somewhere. Well, it's time to go see our old friend the judge and purify some specters. We can find some books here and there, the most notable being this book about the story of the Toad King, where a masked man comes and kills the Toad King, and some other fables about the queen and the guardian of this zone. The Firebird was chosen as the lord of the second zone, so I guess Dedan was the guardian of the first zone. I get the feeling we'll have to face off against this Firebird. Otherwise, all the puzzles in the library are based around matching pages and reading books and such, one of which has us run into more terrified Elson, who await by the shore trying to get to the park, wherever that is. Either way, we run into this here cat as we go to the library. This doesn't look like the judge. This cat introduces himself as Jeffet, the creator of this city and the leader of the specters sent to him in order to restore justice to the zone. At least that's what he claims. Well, hey, here he is. Let's kill this bastard. Halfway through the battle, Jeffet attempts to summon these specters for help, but Nothing happens. Pushing Jafet against the wall, Jafet runs, letting us know that we'll see him again. Huh. But we get this new add-on here, Sun. A father-son duo, I guess. The next part of Zone 2 we move to is the commercial area, where an Elson tells us the mall is full of specters. We run into Zachary again, and mostly just explore this maze of an empty mall. It's not even really a mall, just a giant storage building. While navigating this maze, we can see Jafet wandering around just out of reach of us, and finally, the judge. The judge tells us he's looking for his brother, Valerie, who apparently lives here. Well, we haven't run into Valerie, so we'll let you know, man. At the end of this maze, we find a Padello summoning point, which lets the Padello spawn at the shore where we met the Elson earlier, which means we can go to what I assume is the park. Like the rest of the zone, the park is filled with terrified Elson who are all too worried about the dangers of the park to want to participate. Seems like they've created their own little danger-proof ride, which is 
just sitting still. To move forward, we have to complete the little games and attractions here in the park to get to the boss's office. I started with this little Padello ride, which essentially has a bunch of jets that allow us to move in certain directions. It's kind of like another maze, which if you navigate it correctly, we get to flip another switch off, which lets us access the roller coaster. Another game is a balloon game where I was too stupid to figure it out myself and had to look it up. After playing this against an Elson and winning a nifty little black necktie, the Elson get angry and it turns out it's a burnt. After defeating this Elson, the rest of the Elson freak the fuck out and run around in terror. At the roller coaster, we see a statue of Zachary? Odd. But we can push him on the roller coaster with us and go down. Going to the Elson who runs the ride, we can collect our reaction photo to which he says, wow, you rode with the owner? So Zachary runs this park? Uh, that tracks. Like roller coaster tracks, let's go! We can use this photo to get into the boss's office, but there's no one there except an Elson, so I suppose we move on to the last area of Zone 2, the residential area, using the necktie we won to blend in. Here we find Jeffet berating the Elson, going on about how he is their leader and how useless and terrified they all are, but the Elson don't seem to understand where the voice is coming from, not recognizing the cat as their leader, hoping that whoever it is just calms down. Enraged, Jaffet seems to summon the specters, and this next section is a set of timed battles where we must cleanse the area of specters and save the Elson. After defeating all the specters and running into quite a few burnt Elson as well, the remaining Elson seem appreciative, but well, we seem pretty dangerous with that bat and everything, and they'd prefer it if we leave. So we get kicked out. Outside, we meet the judge. He explains that his brother Valerie seems to have fallen into some delusion that he is Jaffet, the ruler of this place, and the leader of the specters. He needs our help to get to him, as Valerie has run to the top of the library, which is still overrun with specters. Making our way up to the library, we get more information about the story of this zone's guardian, this firebird from earlier. He cared so much for his citizens that he did everything for them, sheltered them from any and all harm. But because of this, they became too reliant on safety and risk averse. So that's why everyone here is so scared. This turn of events drove the firebird insane and angry, taking the form of a cat. Wait, so is Valerie Valerie? Or Jaffet? Or the firebird? Or whoever it is, the story ends with these lines. There is nothing else to be done but wait for the man who would rise forth to destroy him. For deep inside his soul, there was no doubt that what he did was evil. Damn. Reaching the top, we get one more chance to buy stuff from Zachary before coming face to face with Valerie slash Jaffet. The judge recognizes him as Valerie, but Jaffet responds, That is the name of the cat, before we see what's going on. Valerie is dead, and Jaffet, the firebird, has taken control of his body, puppeting him much like we puppet the batter. Sorry, Judge. The battle commences, and as we continue, Jaffet slowly grows and expands out of Valerie's body until he's pierced all the way through, and Valerie is just hanging around the massive bird's neck. When we defeat Jaffet, we see his bloodied and crumpled corpse as the Judge lets out one last Valerie, and we fade to white. The meat baby appears again. The bird. He left too. Before we move on to the next zone, it might be worth looking to see what the purified zone looks like in zone 2. Very similar, more secretaries and everyone is gone. Going back to the top of the library though, we find the judge, meowing out desperately. When we talk to him, he says, I am meowing at my lungs fullest. I would even argue that the echo that reverberates back to me is the voice of someone I know. Have you seen my dear brother? Well, there's not much more we can do besides move on to Zone 3. Right away, we can tell that this area is more industrialized than the others, with towering smokestacks flooding the air with, well, I guess cleaner air because the people here breathe smoke. There are multiple sections to this massive factory, but the first area we have to get through is this mess hall, where you have to use this map to show you where you can safely walk. If you step out, you get placed in a battle and then teleported outside. There are a few different paths here, one of which leads you to a room with Zachary, who is now wearing a mask resembling the judge. When we talk to him, he'll give his own little meow, and at first, he pretends to be the judge. When the batter sees through this act, Zachary fesses up. Zachary now takes the place of the judge as our helper through the game, as the judge is grieving. Zachary keeps the mask, though. What we'll notice exploring this factory is that, unlike everywhere else, the Elson here seem pretty chilled out, not scared of anything. 
to a fault. They seem to think the specters are their friends, and it ends up getting one of them killed. The batter even remarks, people act strangely here. Just getting that now, batter? They're also very enamored with their jobs, their food. They're oddly content, even though their surroundings seem pretty lousy. We begin to understand why when we start seeing memos on the walls telling the employees that the ghosts won't attack them, and an Elson telling us that the directors said the specters are nice. It must be true. We also find another add-on, Holy Spirit. Oh, so this isn't like a family thing, it's a religion thing. I suppose that tracks with the batter's hole vibe. Using the zone's monorail to find a new area, we do some more switch puzzles while the Elson around us seem fixated on something the director is giving them. I'm sure we'll discover what that is soon. And we do. Just behind the door, we see a few Elson surrounded by specters. We know how this goes, or not. The Elson are motivated to fight these specters off in defense of their sugar. So it seems to be what the Elson here are addicted to. Seems like the director has used this addictive substance to motivate and control the Elson here. Believing that the batter is here to take the sugar as well, the Elson attack us and we see they're in an even further state of being burnt. Backtracking to the monorail, the Elson have now become hostile and will attack us if they run into us. We take the monorail up to the smokestacks and then climb to the top. What else is there to do but jump in? Which leads us to this very strange and out of place mini game, but it was a welcome surprise for me. Just very strange. Reaching the bottom, we see how the sugar is manufactured from the corpses of dead Elson. You're here in the sugar ovens of Vesper, the northern part of Zone 3. Here, we burn the corpses of people who have died, and thanks to an ingenious sewer system, transform the vapor into sugar. The tubes which traverse the factory walls direct it to the treatment rooms, where it is washed and purified from the remaining ashes. Then the sugar is distributed to all of the employees for the work they do every day. It's a secret element, the fifth element, the most important element, because without sugar, people could no longer bear reality, and they would go mad. Okay. Well, there's not much for us to do except go back to the monorail where we meet Zachary on our way to the director who is responsible for this mess. There's a pretty funny bit here where Zachary tries to explain the sugar thing again and then the batter interrupts him. On the way, the monorail is stopped by some obstacle. Going out to see what it is, it's another burnt Elson. This encounter is a bit different though. His art is unique and he doesn't use any attacks. He just screams for help. Once you realize this, you might think, Oh, hey, it's time to use the run option. This guy isn't a threat, I don't want to kill him, he isn't doing anything wrong. Until you realize that the flea option is blocked, and it has been for almost the entire game. You may not notice it, but throughout the entire game, there are very few times where you are ever allowed to flee from an encounter. It's either kill or be killed. And so, you have no choice but to beat this defenseless and tortured Elson to death as he screams for someone to help him. And as always, the batter moves on business as usual. From here, we reach the last section of Zone 3 before meeting the director. It's a series of halls and rooms with odd-looking Elson wandering aimlessly. If they run into us, then we have to fight them. It also has some of the strangest puzzles in the game. Essentially, using a note and literal information from the game's included FAQ document, we have to find a series of buttons to press on a PlayStation 1 controller. I could get into the minutia of it, but it really doesn't have any rhyme or reason. It's just odd. But it finally lets us reach the director's office. Let's see this fucker. Holy shit. This is Enoch. He gives us a long spiel about how people are actually happy at this factory and he's a great and caring leader, also notably mentioning that he has no control of the specters or any idea where they come from, before we engage in combat, where we realize he's way too fucking big. This is one of the only times we can flee in the game, because it's impossible to beat him at this point. This leads us to a chase sequence back out to his office. We're able to lose him, but something is different when we come back out. The rooms all look as if they've been purified. We haven't even beat the Guardian yet, but the area has somehow lost its color and residence, making it back to the monorail, which still looks to be alive, and oh shit. Now even bigger, but as the batter points out, completely exhausted from the chase, we are able to have a fair fight against Enoch, ending with us chopping his massive head off. But Enoch's last words reinforce this nagging feeling we've had since we first saw what our purification leaves. This zone, deprived of its guardian, is now destined to disappear, and the men who live here, whether they deserve it or not, will fall into nothingness, never to return. And as always, the batter is unfazed. But Enoch's words do begin to explain things a bit. The guardians seem to be the beings that give these zones life. When we kill them, everything and everyone in these zones disappear. It also explains why the zones started to become purified even before we had beaten Enoch, because he had exhausted his energy. There's a lot more to dig into there as well, but we'll save that for the analysis section. For now, we've completed all of the zones. 
What's left is the mysterious room. Let's get into that. So the room is pretty confusing and convoluted and getting into every detail of exactly what happens, I don't feel like would be very productive. It's broken down into five chapters, counting down from five. Um, so I'll just give a brief rundown of what happens in all of these chapters. This chapter shows us the environment we'll be seeing for this area of the map. A series of hallways, a couple rooms, and an empty bedroom. As you move through the doors and halls, the details in this environment change. Sometimes there will be specters or violent teddy bears, sometimes it will be tranquil and empty. Inside this bedroom, we can see different notes left from someone, presumably a child. Pretty quickly, you catch on that it may be the child we've been seeing between these first boss fights. The notes read, I don't like this place a lot. Luckily, Papa is here. Today we played together. He offered me a comic. He told me that I was ill, so I had to take pills. I don't like these pills. It's pretty odd and confusing navigating this place, but story-wise, that's what's important before we move on to chapter 4. I had three friends. Making our way into the room again, through the bedroom we find a scribbled map that lets us select three different areas, which let us visit three different characters. The tall mister, the bird, and the big mister. In case you hadn't guessed, these are all the different bosses from earlier. When visiting them, we see that they are all in this apocalyptic looking world, and they ask for help in some way. Dedan wants to know what day it is, and Enoch needs help getting unstuck. Jafet is sort of just chilling. Their dialogue is strange though, they don't seem to be talking to the batter, or even us the player. It's like they're talking to a child. And the context of their discussions are odd too. They seem to be referencing something horribly wrong that is going on. The world is broken, time has stopped, and once you help them, they begin to talk about their grand plans to rebuild the world, the cities they one day will be the architects and rulers of. They also make mention that our, this child's, mother is important and may be able to rebuild the world, but She's gone for now, and while she is, maybe they can draft up some ideas. They tell us not to worry about all this grown-up talk and go play outside, which leads us to a hidden dot on the map marked Mama. We see more writing from this child. Hello, Mama. Papa left. I don't like him anyways. I hope he'll be back soon. I made three friends today. The tall mister told me he'd take me on a padello ride, and that we'd all work together to build the world. The little bird told me that he'd show me the sky and the clouds and that we wouldn't have to be scared ever again. The big mister told me he'd bake me cakes. Today was a good day. Please come back soon. Important to note that as each friend is introduced, we see our add-ons appear on screen. We're drawing a specific parallel here. That leads us into, this one is really odd. It's even more confusing to navigate than before because you have to use your save slots to navigate different versions of this world. This is one of the most puzzle heavy parts of the game with things ranging from number puzzles with a giant face on the wall to Elson quizzing you on aspects of the game. The game even flips upside down at one point with a really cool visual. After moving through a lot of these puzzles, we get more dialogue from the child. Today, Papa gave me a comic, but I wanted to go out and play. I hate this place. I'm sure mom will pick me up. On our way to, in this section, we find a comic in the bedroom. Reading it, we see it's titled Panic in Ballville, and it takes us basically to a new game. The main character, Boxer, who is also a boxer, is confronted by his rival, Ballman, a baseball player who has kidnapped his girlfriend and created tons of clones of himself. From here, we play this side-scrolling beat-em-up, except it still functions with a similar RPG combat system. But it's a new style and characters help. Our character is on the other side of the screen now. Navigating through, we're almost Almost overwhelmed. What intrigue? What will happen? The batter shuts the book and says, This is really stupid. They each their own, I guess. Leaving the room, we get some final dialogue from the child. Today, mom finally picked me up. When we come back to the spawn room, Zachary is waiting. Something's about to happen, I can feel it. Zachary informs us that this is the end of the game. Once we head into the room, we'll be facing the queen. He allows us to gear up one last time and leaves us with this quote. It translates to, he who prevails over himself is twice victorious. Let's meet the queen. Moving up a flight of stairs, we come face to face and have an interaction. This conversation is so odd and includes like a narrator that hasn't existed until this point and the English translation had an error in it that completely changed the meaning of the game up until it was updated. So I'll just read the conversation as it is in the new translation. The first thing she said was, you're finally here, batter. Long has been the wait for your arrival, but your way was in vain. You will only cause embarrassment here. Go back home. Always keeping his icy confidence, the batter replied, That's what I did. This cradle is the home of my father. The guardians have fallen. You are the queen of a kingdom that no longer exists. Surprised, but not at all disconcerted, she asked him, 
Why have you destroyed the land that I had rebuilt? The answer was simple. You've never been here to do such a thing. Your role was to take care of him, and you have failed your task. And because of you, I must now complete my sacred mission. Forcing their monotonous dialogue despite the batter's attacks, the queen explained her actions as such. I have created all of this only for him. I desire nothing more than the happiness of my children. Lost in preparing the birthday party, you forgot who it was for. This final retort completely eroded the patience of the queen. You have spoilt the carnival batter. I will not let you lay a hand on the son who brought us into this world. Today, you will fall. And so, we begin our fight with the queen. She has add-ons by her side as well, though much more ornate than ours. The battle is pretty tough, unless you just use auto mode like I did, and does last a bit. But eventually, we do purify yet another enemy. That was very irresponsible on your part, batter. I made a cake for the party tonight. Would you like some coffee, my love? Queen of the flies, it is time to join your disciples. Nothing went right. We must forget it all and dream sweet dreams now. Look, he has your eyes. They are full of fear. We spawn back, this time no Zachary and no save point. Making our way to the bedroom, we find the child, sitting on the ground. I'm here. Hugo, the name of this child, doesn't even fight back. He doesn't have much health either. A few hits and Hugo falls. I'm scared of the dark. From now on, there will be no more darkness. The color drains from the room. This zone again falls to the purification. Going down a long hallway, we see one last switch. But it won't be that easy. The judge is back! Let's go! The judge confronts the batter, saying it was foolish to put his trust in the batter. He confronts him for destroying the world, not purifying it. The batter responds, it's better this way. The judge then questions us, the player. All it took was the separation of the screen for us to kill this innocent child. The judge pleads with us to join him and help him defeat the batter. The batter, in his standard, straightforward demeanor, says, don't do that. Then we're given a choice. Stick with the batter, the official ending, or join the judge for the special ending. Well, most people by now would choose the judge's side, so let's look at that one first. When we enter into combat with the judge, we're met with a shocking sight. The batter now looks like a horribly corrupted creature. One might assume that he has transformed into this true form or something, but according to Mortis Ghost, he hasn't changed at all. We've simply changed perspective. The batter has always looked like this. We've just never been on the receiving end of the bat. Creepy. Surprisingly, the batter here isn't incredibly difficult to beat. Your demented crusade ends here. Die, batter, with the eternal souvenir of not having conducted your sad scheme to its end. It's too late. Everything is lost. I know, but I prefer this over your victory. Hence, nothing remains except for our regrets. And so, the credits roll, while the judge wanders the now empty world of Off as somewhere over the rainbow plays. But that's not the real ending. The batter doesn't simply die. We know there's another choice. Let's look at the other choice, siding with the batter. Siding with the batter, strangely, is also a very easy fight, and the judge falls fairly quickly. It seems both of them were correct. They could only prevail with our help. It's over. Escaping from your purpose is impossible. The batter approaches the switch, and... The switch is now off. Damn, so there you have it, the story of off. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. The game is brimming with open-ended questions, just general oddness, um, but we just did a lot of heavy info dumping here, so before we get right into extrapolating all the themes and stuff like that, I just wanna talk about a couple of the lighter things like Easter eggs and stuff like that, and then we'll have a quick word from a guest and then we can get into the heavy analysis. I just figured we needed to give ourselves a, a bit of a break for our brains. When it comes to secrets, the game does have a good amount of little hidden stuff. Chests that are normally hidden by the camera or in weird areas, or some hidden and hard to reach areas in the smoke mines, mall, and so on. There's also a couple of unique floors to the elevator as well, which to be fair, is the perfect place to put little hidden rooms. Oh, and the classic video game tradition of hiding the dope fish, as first seen in a Commander Keen game, also makes an appearance here. And while it may seem like you've wiped everything out after purifying a zone, you can actually find a surviving Elsin in the purified zone 2, who seems pretty content with the lack of anything. Now there's nothing to be afraid of. There's also apparently an Elsidden hidden out of bounds in zone 1, but I can't find anything on how to actually find this guy. The big secrets though, are the hidden boss and hidden ending. 
That's right, we're not quite done yet. In zone zero, there's a basement that you can access with certain items. Inside, you find a new character, Sugar, surrounded in piles of sugar. She speaks in a sort of confusing non sequiturs before engaging in combat with you. She's got one of the more memorable designs in the whole game, and most people won't ever see her, even in multiple playthroughs of the game. After beating her, she gives us these last lines. I'm feeling way too cold. I didn't like that dance. My dear friend, I think that frightening ducky has won this round. Say goodbye to Zachary for me. Unlike the other bosses, her body just stays on the ground after she dies. Also, I have a feeling that Frightening Ducky is a reference to the batter's appearance. Speaking with Zachary afterwards gives us new dialogue as well. I guess it's better like that. Damn, we just cannot stop ruining people's lives. It seems like Zachary and Sugar knew each other and we're just like, nope, murder. Unlocking the secret endings requires you to gain every grand item. The grand diagonal, the grand spectral, the grand finale, the grand brachial and the Grand Chocolatier, the last of which you get for beating Sugar. In this ending, the regular ending plays out and the credits roll, and then a UFO comes down and a bunch of space apes come out. And now, using the newly purified world, are going to use it to build a robot factory, which will let them defeat their enemies, the flying brains from the planet Aris. The end. Huh? It greatly parallels the secret UFO-related joke endings that exist in the Silent Hill games, and Mortis Ghost has mentioned that it was sort of a tribute to that. Nothing spectacular, but fun nonetheless. All right, we've talked about the development, the presentation, uh, the plot. We've talked about the secrets, the Easter eggs. Before we move into a deeper story analysis, let's just quickly talk about the community that built around it and the sort of reception that the game had. Okay, I know I'm in like the same outfit, but I'm I'm doing Enoch now. I just don't have a bald cap, but like Sugar, for the record, this is Sugar YouTube. Now, I wasn't ever really a part of the off community at the time that it was in its peak. I still wouldn't even call myself in the off community. And this is my first time picking it up was for this video. Probably the first time I was introduced to it was through Markiplier's Let's Play series, which I've heard is where a lot of people got introduced to it. As far as I can tell, the general consensus about the game is positive, although criticisms always do come up about the gameplay. People really are just in it for the art and the storytelling, because the gameplay is just kind of mid. But that's all I can really give from my perspective, because again, I wasn't in the community at the time at all. But I know someone who does have a little bit more experience. Please welcome Nizumi VA to give us a little more of a look at the community of Off. The Off community is one that, though I don't tend to lurk it much nowadays, is one that I found particularly interesting back in its heyday. The reason I got into Off is somewhat unconventional, at least in terms of how most people usually come across things that they like. But I'd say a pretty good chunk, if not the vast majority of Off's early English-speaking fandom came across the game similarly, and that was because of Homestuck of all things. Yeah, sorry to taint your ears, but rest assured that I'm not really going to be diving into that can of worms, other than to say that it was a popular indie webcomic that ran from April 13th of 2009 all the way to the same date in 2016. The comic was updated serially and had several notable hiatuses along the way, with several happening in 2011, 2012, and the first particularly infamous Megapause stretching from mid-April to mid-June of 2013. This would prove to be small potatoes compared to the upcoming Gigapause, which lasted from October of 2013 to the next October in 2014. How this relates to Off, of course, is somewhat perfectly coincidental. Andrew Hussey and Mortis Ghost were not creative collaborators, and personally I'm somewhat thankful for that. But you can imagine that fans of Homestuck, who were the type to ravenously crave a consistent update schedule, and who were very interested in more indie, creator-driven endeavors, would be seeking ways to fill the time while their favorite story was missing in action. So while several avenues would become available to fans depending on their tastes, with the something awful text-based let's play slash translation of the first Danganronpa being another popular Homestuck replacement of the time, more on that series on my channel if you're interested, Off would become the replacement of choice for people less interested in anime dramaticism and more keen to explore stylistically strange worlds and characters. Thus enters Reconstructed Dragon of Starman.net, who published the very first fan-made English translation of Off from its original French on September 8th, 2011, with a subsequent updated translation arriving on Christmas Day of 2012. 
These translations were both rather similar to each other, but the second brought with it many necessary fixes, some of which caused canonical confusion in the English fandom's early days, such as mistranslating the Queen's line about the son who brought us into the world as the son we brought into the world when referring to Hugo. An update to the second translation by Satan was released and even endorsed by Mortis Ghost on June 4th, 2016, but it appears that the link to it is now defunct. Reconstructed Dragon did eventually release a final, third version of the translation on March 5th of 2016, 2018, but many fans feel as though it sucks a lot of the personality out of the game's text in favor of providing a more literal straight-laced translation, meaning that many still prefer version 2 even now. As for my personal experience with the fandom, I'm 26 years old so I've basically got one foot in the grave and hardly remember my own name half the time, let alone fun anecdotes, but I do remember quite a few general trends. For one, fan animations and art were, of course, everywhere. Memes like Death 420's Off Animation were basically community-wide reference material and everyone marveled at the work of Tan Block, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who would often attempt to create small mock-up animations that depicted Off as though it were a serialized cartoon or anime, before attempting to actually do such a thing later, though the progress has predictably been a bit slow given the project's scope. I would see tons of cosplays at my local conventions at the time, most often around Homestuck crowds, which just further established established how intertwined their fandoms were back then, with the Batter and Sucre being popular picks, but Zachary reigning above all. It's hard to describe the chokehold that Zachary in particular had over the fandom, really. He was most often the central figure of fan art that I saw, and he was treated with the sort of Hot Topic-esque reverence that I would only feel confident attributing to other greats of his ilk, like Sans? Gur from Invader Zim? You get the idea. I would often see art depicting him with wings or other such aesthetic changes, done mostly for dramatic purposes but often veering into AU territories, further hearkening to the future with what would become of the many Undertale AUs, which, while similar to this phenomenon, definitely became far larger than Off's ever would. And of course, the shipping. Do I even need to talk about the shipping? The Batter and Zachary, or Battery as it was often known, was obviously the most popular ship given the latter's playful attitude and tendency to pop up often along the Batter's path. I seem to recall Zachary and Sucre being paired together as an item by some as well, but this couldn't really match the sheer numbers and dedication that Battery had in its heyday. I don't really see it around that much anymore, but needless to say, it stood with the pantheon of popular MLM ships at the time, like John Cat or whatever else. Oh god, I mentioned Homestuck again. It is a little sad to see how much the off fandom shrank after its initial boom in popularity, but I also think this was somewhat inevitable. Off is a pretty small game, and though I still know tons of people who appreciate it artistically, it is sort of being phased out by more popular, similar titles that drew inspiration from it, and there's really only so much there to keep a discussion going around when you're part of Act ravenous fandom circles, which especially at the time, were very used to digging through every detail of a story and hungrily awaiting the next part to update and release. Off was never going to retain that momentum, being as self-contained as it was, but I still think there are a lot of us out there who hold a lingering affection for it regardless, and are inspired creatively by it. That's what Off means to me. Okay, so there's a lot to dig into here. Uh, the depth that Off offers in a, a story sense is really enormous, so I'll try and break it up into chunks. First, a literal interpretation of what is actually happening in the world of the game and the story. Then we'll talk about some of the characters and answer some questions that may still be left. Then we'll get into more thematic, sociological, the general analysis of what the game is saying. And then I want to get into what I think the game is really about. So before we go into the more dense sort of theoretical analysis, let's just try and get a breakdown of what this weird world of Off is really, like what's going on in it. Not everything is really clearly spelled out, so it takes a little bit of analysis and looking back on the game. From my point of view, here's what we're seeing. The world of Off came in the aftermath of an apocalypse. Judging by what the Guardians say in Chapter 4, something has happened to the world, and they plan to rebuild it. Hugo, the child we see throughout the game, has some sort of power, something that means he has the ability to create and power worlds. Perhaps his mother does as well, just to a lesser extent. Hugo is also very sick. While his mother is away on some sort of important business, his father attempts to care for him. However, Hugo, only being a child, begins to associate his father's care with his sickness. 
He's the one that keeps him in his room, makes him take pills. He resents him. After the apocalypse, Hugo loses his father and awaits his mother's return. In this aftermath, Hugo ventures out and meets Dedan, Jafet, and Enoch, who all plan to rebuild the world as their own. With Hugo's power and the help of the queen, who is heavily implied to be Hugo's mother, they became the guardians of their own imperfect world, populated by the Elsin. In the queen's mind, this world was created all for Hugo, but in the attempt to build the world, she left Hugo behind. Somehow, it's not entirely clear, the specters begin to infest these worlds, and not long after, the batter just sort of appears. And he has one goal, purify the world, which for him means going up the chain of command and destroying each and every one of them. So yeah, let's take a look at some of the characters and see what we can figure out about them. Some of them I'll have more to say about than others. Okay, so who the hell is this guy? We don't know anything about him or where he comes from, and from the way the queen talks to him, it would almost seem as if the queen is Hugo's mother, and then the batter is his father, right? There's even the baseball player in the comic Hugo's father gave him. Well, according to Mortis Ghost, the batter is created at the beginning of the game, as in this is the first time anyone, including Hugo and the Queen, have ever seen him. So he's not the father, or husband, or anything else like that. And judging by the battle in the two endings, his power is really dependent on who's puppeteering him, meaning without you, he likely would not have been able to wreak the havoc that he did. Just a little more of that weight shifted to us, the player. There are a couple interpretations of where he comes from. One is that while he isn't literally related to any of these people, Hugo is the architect of this world, and being a child, he doesn't have perfect control, so he manifests the batter at the start of the game, either out of some self-destructive desire to tear his own world down, or from the hatred of his father, drawing inspiration from the villain in his dad's comic book. Or both. Another idea is that the batter really functions more on the meta fourth wall level. There's this world that exists, and the batter is merely a puppet with a one-dimensional goal of some constructed righteousness, and we just go along with it because we're told to. He's a video game protagonist, without much nuance in his thinking, he likes his morals and decisions in black and white. He doesn't have a lot of fleshed out personality, he just says what he needs to to keep the plot moving. He exists as a vessel for the player, more as a satire or commentary of the genre of game that he resides in. To be honest, all of these interpretations could be true at the same time. It's also worth noting his personality. Not only is the batter incredibly confident, straightforward, and tied to his unspecified religious convictions, but his reaction to certain things are very telling. Throughout seeing this entire strange world, he rarely questions anything. All the misery, strange rules, ultra paranoid behavior of the Elsin. The only two times he seems to make a comment based on confusion or opinion is when he sees that the Elsin in Zone 3 are happy, and when he reads a comic that portrays a baseball player as an enemy. He also believes that the world is better off, well, off. To me, this characterizes the batter as someone who completely accepts suffering and pain as the default, and a fact of life, which leads to his convictions of turning the world off. It's better this way. But he doesn't see happiness as something equally normal. So when he sees that some Elsin are happy, even though he ends up being right about there being something strange going on, he's confused. Keep this characterization in mind. So, Hugo. We kind of went over a lot of what we know about him in the plot section, but there is a little to unpack here. It seems like he's the source of this world, as it fades when he's killed, and the queen says that he's the one that gave them all life. It's a little difficult to pin down exactly what this means, but to me there are two main ways to take this. One, his abilities are what is able to power the world that these characters live in and the Guardians designed, or that the apocalypse left only Hugo and that all the characters are his creations, who he manifested based on his life. So for instance, the queen may not be his actual mother, but she functions as a manifestation of his mother, just as the batter may or may not have been manifested in some way by Hugo's view of his father, cold, sterile, and out to get him. Again, Hugo's view of his father, not necessarily how his father actually was. Either way, Hugo's power is what seems to run this whole world, and only being a child, it makes sense that things are very flawed. I don't have a lot to say about the queen, because we don't see a ton of her in the game. It's clear she is the one who rules over the other guardians, and I do think there is a significant connection between her and the batter in some way. She's the only other character who has add-ons, and despite their apparently only just meeting for the first time, they both seem to have an understanding of each other, which lends credence to the idea that they function in some way as manifestations of Hugo's parents. In the same way, Hugo's mother being missing from his life while he is sick directly parallels the queen's absence in the face of the specters taking over the zones, and makes sense with the conversation that her and the batter have about this party she's so busy preparing that she
she forgot who it was for. She acts as a great contrast to the batter in general, holding onto the flawed world while also being absent from the destruction that is going on, regal and verbose, while the batter is sterile and stripped down, on the ground with the people in the zone, but his goal is to destroy it. But other than that, I'm not sure what else there is to glean from the queen. Okay, so I just want to briefly touch on the guardians. Self-described utopianists, despite their clear failures, it's worth noting they really seem like they want to build the world back better, however selfish their motivations might be. While Dedan and Enoch are pretty self-explanatory characters, the character of Jafet does genuinely have some nuance. Dedan's world is based on efficient work, and Enoch's world is based on exploiting people into a cynical addiction, Jafet's goal seems genuinely selfless. He wanted to see his people happy, content, and free from fear and pain. And his descent into madness and subsequent death, and the fact that he realizes what he's been doing is wrong and deserves to be overthrown, I think it makes him one of, if not the most interesting character in the whole game. Okay, so there's actually a little bit to talk about here. A lot of stuff just sort of happens with the Elsin, and they are the characters you run into the most. I guess the first thing to try to explain is what the burnt ailment is. Well, it seems to be something that just affects the Elsin and seems to have one root cause overstressing the Elsin. Whenever the Elsin seem to get too agitated or stressed, you usually see them turn into burnt Elsin not long after. A good example of this is when the Elsin in Zone 3 are worried about you taking their sugar, or when the ghosts are chasing the Elsin around in Zone 2. It's also worth noting, while much of the world seems to be powered by the Guardians and Hugo, the Elsin aren't directly under their control. We can see this with some Elsin surviving the purification, and the fact that the Elsin don't always listen to what the Guardians tell them to do. So they seem to be separate, completely conscious beings. I think the judge represents, aside from just the video game guide, is a more hopeful side of this world. While the Elsin are generally miserable, the world isn't filled with only suffering. The judge seems rather cheerful and appears even to have a family, or at least a brother. Unfortunately, even things for the judge go downhill pretty fast, but unlike some of the other characters, the judge seemed to find his way in the world just fine before the batter showed up. While some of the Elsin live in such paranoia and terror that they prefer to be killed, the judge is the voice that says, no, I think that life is worth living, which I think is helpful to balance the constant dreariness. It also makes Valerie's death and the judge's final boss fight hit that much harder. However, there isn't a lot else you know about the judge. Oh, his name is Pablo, that's something. The judge is just his title, which has led some to believe that he was also appointed some role by the queen, but this isn't exactly clear either. He's just a fun cat guy, I suppose, and hey, I appreciate having a fun cat guy in a video game. Okay, so Zachary is a bit of an enigma. I don't think he really fits into the world, but that's sort of his whole thing. He constantly breaks the fourth wall about his role as the RPG merchant, and then takes up the role of the judge, making comments about that too. He even leads you outside of the game to solve certain puzzles. As a character, he doesn't represent much of the world of the game, but more so in the meta context of the game. There's one exception to this though. Sugar. While there isn't a lot to know about Sugar, it's clear her and Zachary have some sort of relationship or past, which isn't ever really expanded upon. But this gives some depth to both characters. Sugar isn't just a hidden character, she has some past that relates to the rest of this world, probably connected in some way to Sugar we see in Zone 3. And Zachary, despite being a self-conscious meta character, has created a relationship and connections with people within this world. Okay, so what exactly happens when a zone is purified? At first, it's not entirely clear. Does it end all life and dynamics within the area? That's what it might appear at first, but then there's the secretaries and the surviving Elsin. And what is up with the secretaries? Well, according to Mortis Ghost, the secretaries are the creatures that come through the worlds after the guardians are killed and wipe out all the Elsin. So the actual power of the guardians isn't what keeps the Elsin around, they're just keeping the secretaries out. This is what it tells me. After the apocalypse, everything went stark black and white. It's possible the secretaries are part of this apocalypse and the guardian's power is used to stave them off, so when they're killed, the world returns to how it was during the apocalypse, and the secretaries have free reign to destroy everything and everyone. I think this also explains why the worlds are full of color, but the characters are black and white. They existed before this apocalypse, and so they still are what they are. This color isn't the default state, it's a side effect of the power the guardians hold, which explains why the Elsin can survive afterwards. Also, a note on the secretaries. Secretaries. While it seems like this purification is the batter's goal, it's worth noting that the secretaries are not only attacking the batter, but also described as demonic in some of the translations, which is in direct opposition to the batter's whole 
wholly aesthetic. It makes the whole relationship between the batter and the effects of his mission more complicated. For this one, I don't really have a clear answer, but both of my theories revolve around the queen. Some believe the queen sent the specters, her answer or punishment to the failings of the three zones. The other idea is that while they may have just been a natural phenomenon in the world, they started popping up because of the queen's neglect. I mean, none of the actual guardians have any control over them, and they all appear to be either trying to fix or ignore the problem, and the queen is completely leaving them out to dry. Okay, this one's just a fun little theory. There's a book in the library that tells the story of this masked figure killing a king, and it has been interpreted by a lot of people as being about Zachary because of his frog-like mask. Anyway, just a fun idea. This is my best attempt at a Jaffet costume, because it's like inside the mouth of the cat, and then Jaffet's attacks are all like music-based, so I've got like my music stuff in the background and the keyboard cat. Anyway, okay, now that we've laid some of the groundwork for the literal interpretation of the story, let's get into the more theoretical and analytical side. Starting with the simpler section, the religious imagery and references in Off. Now, at first glance, it may seem like Off has a lot to say about religion, with all of the religious allusions and references and imagery and names, but when you take a closer look at it, it's clear that Off is using a lot of this religious imagery and aesthetics to do something completely different. The use of the Holy Trinity with the add-ons, the batter's language about this holy mission of purifying the sinful and all of that, it's definitely there. On top of that, each of the Guardian's names come from biblical names. The Queen is once noted as Father God. The whole game is brimming with Judeo-Christian symbolism. In my view though, this is being used as shorthand for the feeling Mortis Ghost wants us to understand about the batter's view. He's coming at his mission from a religious level of conviction. It's not just a moral issue, he's being sent on a holy mission, a vessel for a greater purpose. He's on a crusade. The closest analog I can link this to in the way it uses religious uh, imagery is Evangelion, where there's tons of religious imagery and names and language, but it's in service of a story that is sort of disconnected from that. We'll talk a bit about Evangelion later as well. One thing that it does with this interestingly though is this connection to make the add-ons and the guardians, this holy trinity. We don't know much about exactly what these add-ons are, but they seem in some way to represent each of the guardians. Perhaps something straightforward like a manifestation of their energy, perhaps something more metaphorical like representing their stories or friendships with Hugo. And in that way, there's an underlying irony about the batter using them to actually kill the guardians at the end of each zone, collecting them to fight by his side right before destroying them. The aspect of religion that this game I think focuses on the most is this idea of creating a creation myth. The world of Off is strange, but the way it's revealed to us is even stranger. Instead of a monologue at the beginning of the game, or listening to conversations and beginning to understand things from context, we're served essentially exposition by the people in the world. Now, that may seem to be a big no-no in regular storytelling, but I think it serves to benefit this creation myth angle. We hear about how all of these things came to be, and the functions they serve, and it all just feels so myth-like, like the ancient stories of how an alternate earth came about. The plastic oceans exist, so there's an end to the land. The world was born from this child who somehow has this power and survived a fall of an older, ancient world. I mean, even the three Guardian stories and how they met Hugo. Time stopped and so Dedan needed it to be corrected. Enoch, a massive giant, needed to be freed from a gorge by Jafet and his other birds. Each part of this game feels like fables and myths that attempt to explain how the world works, just an alternate world from the one we exist in. Well, I don't know if this was intentional or just an artifact of Mortis Ghost's off-the-wall writing style, it does make for an interesting lens to view the game's story through. Video essayist says that game is secretly about capitalism? No way, no way, there's- Okay, I'll try not to make this too long, but- The world the game creates is a tuned up view of a system that breaks workers down into cogs in a machine run by disconnected, out of touch, and exploitative leaders who engineer their worlds based around productivity and not the needs of the people working there. Except Jafet, because he's cool. The Elsin are all exact copies of each other, suited up in white collars and black ties, working in cartoonishly industrialized and at times pointless positions. The library is filled with fake books. The workers in the sugar factory produce a drug that they only use so that they can bear the cruel and disturbing work of actually producing the sugar in the first place. But more specifically than the heightened view of modern capitalism the game portrays, or just any system that focuses on more productivity and growth than people, 
It focuses on the nature of the exploitation of doing this work. Going back to the sugar, aside from just being this sort of futile loop of producing and consuming, the elves in there describe it as necessary to bear reality. Not just serving as an obvious connection to drugs, but really anything that people consume to distract themselves, that they can be addicted to. Media, food, talking with the Elson reveals this stark reality they live in, constantly afraid or downtrodden, pushed to their limits to uphold the system that their guardians designed and that the queen has ignored, until finally they snap. What I'm saying is the Elshin should be the next, he's just like me for real, guys. Again, these aren't the most groundbreaking things to point out, but the game builds this directly into the world. Okay, so the last little socio-political reading of this game that I think you can make is it talking about industrialization and the environment. The world building of the game creates this very striking and tragic image of a starkly industrialized world that I can't help but feel in some way acts as a critique, satire, or in some fashion reflection of our world. And I don't think it's even very subtle, which isn't necessarily a bad thing but it really does feel like it's trying to create a parallel to the impacts of industrialization and as the impact of that, the issues of climate change and pollution. First of all, each of the elements in this game have direct parallels to specific things that act as necessities to us, but twisted in some way to reflect the degradation and issues these things face. Let's break it down. Plastic is probably the most obvious of all the elements. The ocean of the world is filled not with water, but liquid plastic. I wonder what that's commentary on. Smoke being the air people breathe, gathered from mines in a similar fashion to how our fossil fuels like coal, which in turn are burned and pollute the air that we breathe. Others are a little less obvious, like metal, but there's still stuff there. Metal is extracted from animals, where they're used as a resource to extract raw materials from, farmed in small pens, and the Elson themselves say not to get attached to them. They're seen as materials, nothing more. And for meat, they fill these massive pools with gallons of paste-like meat, more than anyone could actually eat, the excess turning into pools and waterfalls of dead tissue and food waste. All of these elements being manipulated in this way not only serve as parallels to our world, but also help build a picture of where the world of Off came from. Humanity wiped out because of our out-of-control impact on the environment. And yet, from that, life still exists. Life goes on even after what appears to be a point of no return, when the oceans are just plastic and the air you breathe is smoke. In some ways, the fact that there's still conscious life in this world seems hopeful. Life finds a way. But the world is far from perfect, and the question becomes, is it worth living in a world like that? That is the question that lies at the center of the main philosophical reading of Off. Okay, so I want to talk about this section fairly briefly for a couple reasons. Number one, it's a reading of the game I've seen talked about before. And number two, I have very strong thoughts on a lot of these philosophical ideas, and I refuse to let myself rant for two and a half hours about, like, nihilism in the ship of Theseus in my off video. Okay, so the core of this comes down to the batter's mission and what his purification leaves behind. At first, it seems like the batter is just there to clear the world of specters, but especially after what Enoch says, the killing of Hugo and the confrontation with the judge at the end, we begin to see what he's actually there for, to destroy the world completely, to leave nothing. Enoch confronts him about this, telling him that the world and the people in it will be doomed by what he's doing, whether they deserve it or not. This does not phase the batter's convictions, nor does killing the Elson on the railway, nor does killing a defenseless child. And the batter is confronted with this reality again when the judge comes to stop him. The batter's response is, it's better this way. This behavior of the batter can pretty easily be extrapolated into an understanding of what his beliefs behind his quest really are. The batter sees the world as irredeemable. The presence of this suffering justifies, no, necessitates its destruction. An example of this bubbling to the surface in the dialogue is after the batter kills Hugo. I'm afraid of the dark. From now on, there will be no more darkness. When nothing exists, there is nothing to be worried about. No fear, no sadness no suffering. An equivalent philosophical viewpoint may be antinatalism, which functions under the premise that reproduction is wrong because the person cannot consent to existing, and therefore cannot consent to the suffering that life brings. That's a basic interpretation of it anyway, and it's clear that the batter takes a much more violent approach to this concept than just advocating for people to stop giving birth. And in a general sense, the game seems to paint the batter as in the wrong. As Enoch says, he's acting out his plan without caring about the people it affects. Or 
perhaps believing his view is superior and not allowing the people of this world, from culpable parties like the Queen to helpless and generally kind Elsin, to make any choice surrounding their own lives and importantly their deaths. I mean, if you want to make someone look bad, you make them beat a child to death with a baseball bat. But it does pull a question where he's coming from. Is it really mercy to free the Elsin from the objectively poor, demeaning, and miserable living conditions? What about us stopping the batter by siding with the judge? The judge even says, it's pointless, everything is already gone. Questions like these are not new. These moral concepts have been discussed throughout history, specifically by generations whose futures seem bleaker than that of their parents or grandparents. So especially Gen Z and Millennials, which I think is one of the reasons this game speaks to its audience in the way that it does. And it does a lot of interesting stuff to make us question our perspective. When the Elsin appear burnt, are they really overtaken by some ailment? Or is that the batter's perspective of what suffering has done to them, similar to how he sees himself as a fairly normal person, only for the judge and sugar to see him as a giant monster? And the black and white world he leaves behind may be reflective of some of the flaws in his thinking. His morals are all or nothing, black and white. And here's the thing, I don't want to leave this section feeling empty or depressing. So let me end it with this. If you're feeling similarly, like suffering isn't worth it, that the world is treating people unfairly, the best advice I can give you is to take a little time out of your day to make someone else happy, to help improve someone's life. I guarantee it will make you feel just as good as it makes the other person feel. And everyone could use a bit of help. Okay, so this last section before I get into what I think the game is really about, uh, there's a lot of interesting allegorical readings of Off um, that mostly focus around Hugo. I mean, he is this sort of strange anomaly that like powers the world, and there's a lot of interesting readings that come from that. Firstly, is the idea that the batter is a disease, slowly killing Hugo and eventually turning him off. This feels like it makes sense as the world of the game seems in some ways to be created or powered by Hugo. This can be either more literal, that all of this is happening in Hugo's mind as he's treated somewhere in a hospital or in a coma, or that this is a more general allegory for how a disease slowly consumes somebody. The other way I've seen this game function as an allegory is more in a general sense. The batter represents this self-destructive aspect of Hugo. The flawed world filled with addiction and crappy bosses and ghosts all represent these issues in Hugo's life, and the batter represents a self-destructive desire to end it all that he fights until it finally overcomes him. While I think these are valid interpretations, it does feel a little bit dream theory-y. Alright, this is the best I got for Dedan. Goodwill coat. Everything's like tilted and off. Okay, so while I was going through to research this game and trying to figure out what it was saying about different things, an epiphany struck me. It wasn't that it was a new part of the game I hadn't considered before, but I was just realizing how much this game hammers this specific point home. This aspect of the game that a lot of people just think of as like this fun quirk or twist, I think really is the main driving force of what this game is about. Off isn't about antinatalism or climate change. I mean, it can be, but I think what Off is really trying to show us is a meta-commentary of the exact genre that it exists in. Everything from the batter's motivations to each of the characters to the end of the game serve to function in this larger picture of making you, the player, think about the nature of the video games you're playing. Let me explain. Let's start with the opening of the game. The very first thing we learn is that we, the player, and the character of the batter are entirely separate entities. The batter is a puppet. We control him. Right out of the gate, the game is pointing out its own nature, that it is a game and that you are in control of this character. And throughout the game, over and over, we are reminded of this. It's one of the first things the judge mentions. Not to mention Zachary constantly breaking the fourth wall, making comments about his place in the game, what part of the story you're in, taking the place of the guide when the judge is gone. Hell, the game includes a puzzle where you have to read through Mortis Ghost's Q&A for the answer. The game is constantly telling us, you are playing a video game. Now, let's take a look at the batter. What do we really know about him? The answer is... Not much. He's created at the beginning of the game with this vague, righteous quest and doesn't really say a whole lot. In contrast to the verbose and personality-filled characters like the Judge or Jaffet or Enoch, the batter just barely says what he needs to in order to keep the plot rolling, with some vaguely religious one-liners and quotes thrown in. The batter functions as a perfect satire of an RPG protagonist. Not much personality, just there for the player to fill his shoes. A vague quest for justice or something, justifying his slaughtering of tons 
and tons of enemies and people throughout the gameplay of the story. We've applied a lot of characterization to him based off some of his lines, that he wants to leave the world stark and barren, but remember, the secretaries are the ones destroying everything in the wake of the Guardians being gone. The batter doesn't really specify what his goal is, except I suppose shutting the switch off at the end. And the batter isn't killing everyone, just people that get in his way, and the bosses. The batter simply moves from boss to boss trying to get to the end of the game, just so he can shut it off. His goal as the protagonist is to get you to the end of the game. Finish it, play through it, and then turn it off. Go from boss to boss on a vague mission to get to the end of the game. And so many of the choices in this game seem to reflect this satirization and commentary on the RPG genre, and just games in general. Once you purify a zone, it becomes barren and hostile, but why would you need to go back? You completed this level, you beat the bad guy. The final confrontation with the judge really begins to put this into perspective. You've been mindlessly following the vague mission of this protagonist because it's what you're supposed to do. All it took was the veil of the screen for you to become a violent murderer. Do you have any idea why you're doing this? Any consideration for the destruction you've left behind? Why would you? You're playing a game, you're on a mission. You're the good guy. The goal of this game, as far as I can tell, is to make you question and think deeper about both the messaging and content of the media you consume, specifically games. And that's part of why I think this black and white color scheme and one-dimensional moral view the batter seems to carry helps reinforce, is the answer really to just kill everyone? What nuance is lost? How do we handle the violence we're encouraged to participate in within video games? The theme might remind you of another game too, in fact maybe a few, which is why in this next segment I want to take a little bit of time to cross-analyze off with some of the games it inspired, and I think we'll see some parallels with. It's from Undertale. Now the question is, is this a judge costume? or a Zachary costume. All right, so the first piece of media I wanna talk about here that I feel like I wanna cross analyze is something that I might end up incorporating into the title and thumbnail because, well, it's really popular. And I do think there is a connection to be made here. Undertale. <laughs> now, it's clear that Undertale takes a lot of inspiration from games like the Mother series, something that a lot of RPG Maker games do as well, although strangely not off. But we know for a fact that Toby Fox, the creator of Undertale, at least took a bit of inspiration from off, at least on the surface level. Papyrus's design was inspired by Dedan, Napsablook's theme was inspired by Pepper Steak, but the real parallel here is that of the genocide run. Now, I'll be honest, I don't really understand. I'm not really an expert in Undertale lore, but from what I can tell, Undertale's genocide run plays out very similar to the plot of Off, including the end battle with Sans paralleling the judge, calling you out for playing with these characters' worlds like, well, a game. I think there's a decent argument to be made that Undertale did it better, giving that culpability of the player some extra weight by giving them the actual choice to spare people and choosing not to, where Off just sort of makes you do it to continue playing the game and then goes, hey, that was bad of you to do that. Why'd you do that? But let's give Off a break here. It was almost a decade before Undertale came out, so it's hard to criticize the game for not doing it perfect the first time around. But it wasn't really the first. Moon Remix RPG Adventure is a 1997 RPG for the PlayStation, and it is... odd. The opening shows a kid playing through a game titled, well, Moon. We see him grinding experience by killing any number of monsters and enemies, looting items from villagers' homes, and then somehow, the child is transported into the world of the game, and that's what we play as. This kid attempting to repair the world in the wake of the destruction this hero left behind. But inevitably, the hero makes it to the end and the game presents a choice. The way to put the end to this cycle of violence is turn the game off. Don't let any of it start to begin with. And if that game did not directly inspire off, I would be genuinely surprised. Moon also seems to have vaguely inspired Petscop too, so there's that. There's some non-video game media that I feel like I should mention here before I get into our last segment, looking at some more directly inspired games and fan games. Like I mentioned, Evangelion actually has a lot of interesting parallels to off, mainly in the way it uses Christian symbolism, not to tell a directly religious story, but as an aesthetic and storytelling device to tell a separate story. With Evangelion, we can almost see this as the 
the other side of the coin when Western media depicts Eastern mysticism, not as what it actually is, but using it more as an aesthetic to add an air of mystery or foreign nature. It's interesting seeing Off use Christian symbolism in this way though, because it is a Western piece of media. So there are some unique aspects to it there. Okay, so this is just gonna be a quick shout out to some games that took direct inspiration from Off. So if you want more of this type of game, check these out. Home is probably the biggest Off fan game in which you take control of the judge and see the world from his little cat view. Suits, a business RPG, takes heavy visual inspiration from Off and takes focus on the business corporate side of things. And Hello Charlotte, another game that takes inspiration from Off, where you control Charlotte, whom you puppet. So if you're itching for more Off, go check those out. So that was Off, yet another RPG Maker game talked about in this retrospective series. But to be honest, this video got way bigger than I expected it to, and it took a lot longer because November ended up being such a crazy busy month. So thank you everyone for being so patient. Um, check out Off in the description. Thanks so much to Nazumi VA for this that awesome community section. Definitely check her channel out if you like the type of stuff I make. You can check out my links in the description, my album, and SaganHawks.net, which will eventually be updated, but that's got some stuff there right now. Thanks again to the patrons, and I will see you all next time. Bases, bases all around. The industry is crumbling down. Whether the weather is fair or not, the baseball game must be stopped. Diamond, Minecraft, villager. Would you call yourself a pillager? NFTs, money.